This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Etymology, coming from etymon, meaning the sense of truth, and logia, meaning study, is the study of what words really mean, or rather, where words come from. Anyone who has read my book Firmament will tell you that I find this subject fascinating. So in this quick video, I just want to talk about the interesting origins of a couple of words. Before we start, I should point out that while we are very sure about a lot of this, much of etymology is conjecture, and there can be many theories for why a certain word ended up a certain way. For example, the English word big may have come from a Northern English dialect, or it may have come from the Old Norse verb to inhabit. In those cases, I'm going to go with the consensus opinion, but just note that that may be incorrect. Firstly, water. Compare how in English we say water, but in German Wasser, and in Swedish Vatten. That's because those languages all share a common lexical ancestor, a hypothesized common language of Northwestern Europe that existed about 2000 years ago called Proto-Germanic, something that linguists have pieced together using these commonalities between different languages. Proto-Germanic, however, is hypothesized to have come from an older reconstructed language that was originally spoken around the Black Sea area about 6,000 years ago, before migrations carried its speakers across Europe and into India. That language is Proto-Indo-European, and it represents the oldest common ancestor of languages as diverse as English, Urdu, Spanish, Gujarati, Russian, and many more. Water in English comes from water in Proto-Germanic and water in Proto-Indo-European. So the word we use to refer to this has been basically unchanged for about 6,000 years. It's one of the oldest words in the English language. Proto-Indo-European also sometimes allows us to drill into the core meaning of a word, like star. So this comes to English also from Proto-Germanic, sterno, which originally comes from the Proto-Indo-European, heistrita? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. That word is a compound of the verb to burn, and a suffix indicating it's a noun, meaning that in the original Proto-Indo-European, star meant burning, or shining, thing. Which is kind of incredible, really, because our ancestors had no way of knowing that those pinpricks of light up in the sky were actually well, burning things. It should be noted, though, that English isn't really one language. It's more like eight languages in a trench coat. It's a blend of words from all kinds of languages from all over the world. Skull is a word that entered into the English language around the 10th century with the cultural exchange program organized by the Vikings. Generally speaking, if you find a hard K in an English word, like in skin or skill or skirt, it probably comes from Old Norse. Skull is a particularly charming one, not so much because of the word itself, but because of what it replaced. So Anglo-Saxon, meaning England before the Viking contact, would have referred to skin as hide, and skill as craft, those words actually surviving to the present day as some of English's many redundancies. Broadly speaking, if there are multiple words for the same thing in English, they come from different lexical roots. So for example, pig and swine, sheep and mutton, venison and deer, all respectively come from Old French, via the Norman invasion, and Old English. Skull, however, has unfortunately completely replaced the far more charming Anglo-Saxon word for the same thing, brain pan. Which I just think is a loss. Sometimes words directly port over into English from another language, such as, for example, Sudoku, and we call those loan words. Whereas we also get phrases that are just translated word for word into a new phrase in English, for example, ball lightning, which in German is Kugelblitz, and we call those calcs. Though interestingly, calc is itself a loan word from French, and loan word is a calc from the German Lehnwort. Something that might be unique, however, is anime, because this is an example of a double loan word. The English word animation was loaned into Japanese as animation, which was then shortened to anime to refer to Japanese animation, which was then loaned back into English. And if anyone else can think of any other examples of double loan words like this, please let me know in the comments, because I think that's really cool. Place names often have fascinating etymologies that reveal the links between language and philosophy. Finisterre in Western Spain is derived from the Latin phrase finisterre, 
Apologies to any Latin scholars I just offended, by the way. I went to a normal school, meaning the end of the Earth. It was called this because early and medieval Christians believed there was a connection between time and space, specifically how far east or west you were. In the east, where the sun rose, was the creation of the world, and in the west, where the sun set, was the end of the world, and salvation. Thus, being the most westerly point in Spain, though it actually isn't, Finisterre was the closest you could get on Earth to the end of the world, and salvation, where the walls of heaven were as thin as a curtain, transparent as glass. Another place name that's a bit more mysterious is Wolverhampton in England. Now, England is a mess of place names. Matt Nen did a whole great video about this. But Wolverhampton stands out. Its name comes from Wolfrun, or Wolfruna, an Anglo-Saxon woman who, in the year 985, was granted a Heaton, a big farm or enclosure, by King Ethelred the Unready. This was Wolfrun's Heaton, or Wolverene Hamptonia in Latin, which became Wolverhampton in English. But where did Wolfrun get her name? Well, Wolf comes from Wolf, and Run comes from Proto-Germanic, meaning secret or mystery. It's the same root, actually, as Rune. So you have a woman who has both Wolf and mystery in her name, and she has a son whose nickname is Spot. I'm not saying the city was founded by a werewolf, but I'm not not saying it. And then lastly, not a word, but a piece of mathematical notation. All the symbols we use in maths have to come from somewhere, but most of the time it's pretty obvious. Like the equals sign, for example, first introduced in the 16th century, is just two lines of equal length. This is a bit more interesting, however. This is an integration sign. So when you integrate a mathematical function like, say, y equals x squared, you're calculating the area between the function and the x-axis. We say we do this by imagining bars between the function and the x-axis, and sum up the areas of these bars. The total is the integral. Specifically, however, those bars are infinitely thin, an idea that proved really controversial. So this is a kind of spicy summation in that infinitely small limit. So how did we end up with this? Well, this is just the letter S, but a specific kind. It's called a long S. You've probably seen it elsewhere in inscriptions and in old documents. When Gottfried Leibniz introduced the idea of integration as being a special kind of sum, he just described it using the letter S. It looks way scarier than it actually is. In fact, if you've always wanted to understand things like calculus better, or if you'd like to brush up on your knowledge, then look no further than Brilliant's course, Calculus in a Nutshell. Brilliant is a highly interactive website and app that allows you to truly understand topics in maths, science, and computer science by guiding you through hands-on courses. Rather than just giving you a wall of information, Brilliant guides you step-by-step -step through a concept with interactive demonstrations and exercises. And if you ever feel stuck, it provides in-depth explanations to break down the material for you even more. Calculus may not be your thing, however. Maybe you'd like to brush up on everyday maths like fractions or arithmetic, or learn a completely new skill like reinforcement learning. Brilliant has you covered with dozens of professionally written courses. And don't worry if you're busy. Courses are presented in bite-sized chunks, allowing you to learn at your own pace in a no-pressure environment, even on your commute if you're still doing one. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash simonclark, or click the link in the description, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching this one. I had a ton of fun making this, and I just hope you enjoyed watching as much as I enjoyed researching and writing this. Please do let me know if you'd like more etymology content in the future. You can watch one more video, right? Here's some recommended ones. There's even one about etymology, look. If you did enjoy this video, please do pop it a like, share it with people that you think might find this interesting, and if you're not already, please do subscribe to the channel to be notified when I make new videos. That just leaves me to say thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.